Good morning. Welcome, and I'm very happy to have you on, to be able to engage you this morning from my point of view and for you to engage me with your questions. Um, it's always a happy feeling to know that when you're talking, other people are paying attention, and more than that, they have an interest in what you're doing. So I thank you especially for being here this morning and for engaging me in this discussion. First of all, I owe you an apology. Last Tuesday, I was not here, and I made an arrangement to be here on Friday at the same time, but I could not be here either. I just want to let you know that I was not available on Tuesday because I wanted to attend the pre-budget meeting of the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association because they had all their major business organizations there. And I wanted to, I wanted to listen to what they had to say and the recommendations they wanted to make for their upcoming budget. Um, and when I rescheduled to Friday, it turned out that one of my good friends, uh, Curtis Pierre, uh, was going to be buried, cremated on that particular day. And I could not miss the funeral because Curtis had worked with me when I used to be General Secretary of the NAR and he was the main managerial support in the NAR Secretariat on Albion Street. And uh, uh, up to not too long before he died, the kind of person Curtis was, uh, he would send me little jokes, notwithstanding the fact that he really was deteriorating and dying because he always had a wonderful sense of humor. So I had to go to that funeral. So I offer my apologies and I thank you for being with me today. Today, I want to talk about sea level rise and climate change and the implications of climate change for countries such as ours. I wasn't sure what I would talk about yesterday. I was thinking actually that I would talk about some things that we should be thinking about before the budget is presented on October 7th. But when the rains came last night and this morning, at a time when we were expecting uh, very severe high temperatures approaching 40 degrees centigrade today, uh, that jolted me about the reality of climate change. And I thought I would deal with that particular issue today in Trinidad and Tobago because it affects us directly as a set of small islands. You know we have seven islands. We have the five islands off the coast of Chagaramas and we have Tobago and Trinidad. So there are seven islands. And I thought that we might talk about that. And of course, most of the countries of the Caribbean are either um, islands or they are coastal countries uh, that are subject to the vagaries of climate change and sea level rise. Okay, but before I get into that, I want to say something about Dr. Keith Rowley and the manner in which he and his ministers deal with the leader of the opposition, Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bissessor. I really find it despicable that the Prime Minister of a country would behave towards the leader of the opposition in a manner which suggests to any discerning person that part of the reason he feels that he has the freedom and the right to do that is because Mrs. Posad Bissessa is a woman. 
I find that contemptible coming from him. And it is not just from him. It comes also from Faris al-Rawi, who is particularly brutal to Mrs. Bissessa in the parliament. And often when he's speaking, he's the last speaker in the debate. And therefore, it is impossible to get up and respond to him. This is also true to a lesser extent of Stuart Young, the Minister of National Security. It is also a factor in the behavior of uh, Mr. Hines, the representative from Laventil West. And Mrs. Camille Robinson Regis, although she is a woman and she represents the women's arm of the PNM, is also particularly nasty in the pronouncements and statements that she makes having to do with Mrs. Passard Bissessa as leader of the opposition. And I feel that the bad example of Keith Rowley as leader of his party and leader of the government is a contributory factor to that. I want to say that the, the country as a whole, reasonable people, sane people, people who want a better quality of politics in Trinidad and Tobago, should really express their abhorrence for the manner in which the PNM in general and the um, Prime Minister of this country behaves towards Mrs. Bissessa and the kind of things that he says about her publicly are most atrocious things meant to demean and to humiliate and to bring ridicule to her. I do not think that that is right and we should not condone it. The Dr. Rowley and his ministers already say contemptible things to the population and to sections of the population. And I really believe that it is uh, something that should not be tolerated and that should, they should pay a price for this awful behavior that has become their habit, all right, as part of the culture of the ruling party in Trinidad and Tobago. I thought it was important to say that since I know that the people who listen to this program are decent and reasonable people who have an interest in developing their country. And while we must deal with the economic matters and the financial matters, the educational matters, the health matters, the way in which we conduct ourselves and behave and the standards that we set as leaders and as people who aspire to high office, these things are also important for the evolution and progress of our society. But I promised you to deal with climate change, and today I want to deal with that. Now, I wouldn't deal with the causes of climate change. That is a very, very important area in which tons of research are taking place and the information that is provided is available readily. What I want to deal with is the effect of climate change on islands and therefore its implications for a place such as Trinidad and Tobago and indeed the other countries of the Caribbean. Now, I will mention 10 effects of climate change uh, because there are many more on islands, okay? So there might be a hundred effects or even more on islands because of the change in climate. But I want to mention just 10 that are immediate and present for us in Trinidad and Tobago so that we may first of all be conscious of it and be alert to it and secondly understand that we have to do something about it. The first thing that I would say about climate change is that for us, in which we have a rainy season and a dry season, climate change really means for us more rain than we would normally expect and that is likely to increase the volume of water that comes on land um, from rain. And secondly, 
that the dry season is likely to be hotter and more intense and drier so that we are likely to have a situation in which we can have heavy rains uh, which has a number of implications uh, followed by very very dry months uh, that approach drought conditions which can also have serious implications. Um, but one of the consequences of climate change for islands such as ours is the issue of sea level rise. I always remember in 2013 I was in the Bahamas. I had gone there for an IDB meeting in which the IDB was holding their um, the Caribbean meeting with all the countries of the Caribbean that engaged the IDB and Bahamas was the location. And during the meeting, I think at the beginning, um, Prime, the Prime Minister of Bahamas was Mr. Christie at the time. And he made the point during his presentation on that meeting that if the sea level were to rise one foot in the Bahamas, which is a country made up of 700 islands and in which 30 of the 700 are inhabited, that the Bahamas would lose two-thirds of the islands that it now had. That is to say, two-thirds of the islands of the 700 would be covered by water. And that is how serious this business of climate change and the impact on sea level rise can have for the Caribbean. And for Trinidad and Tobago, I think people know that we are losing parts of the coast in Cedrus. We know that the water is encroaching in Mayaro and that the distance between the road and the shoreline in Manzalina and Mayaro is becoming uh, smaller. And so it is happening in different parts of the area as the seawater hits the shore. So sea level rise is one consequence. The second one is what I mentioned before. You will have more rainfall. You'll have harsher dry seasons. And with the possibility of drought conditions when the sun is hot and also with the potential for flooding when you have uh, heavy rains. Um, I want to also mention that with sea level rise, you have more coastal erosion because you have storm surges and this is in fact a threat to settlements along the coast as well as to infrastructure, whether those that infrastructure be roads or other things that we have built. Um, we also have in the Caribbean the reality that we live with, is, which is that a significant part of the population lives within two miles from the shoreline. And we have roads and airports and capital cities and residential settlements across uh, along the coast so that in Trinidad and Tobago and in all the countries of the Caribbean all of these things the human settlements the roads the airports capital cities residential settlements located along the coast are all threatened by sea level rise and water surges and so on. now one of the things we don't always take into account is that In a situation in which your country is getting hotter and the sea level is rising, the fresh water resources that you have can be threatened and reduced. Now this is very important because water scarcity is a major issue in countries around the world and, and it is predicted that wars are going to take place over these kinds of things, the, the battle for water, freshwater resources. And I think in Trinidad and Tobago, 
I think you know from this last experience during the dry season, water had to be rationed here. So we need to take into account that as the sea level rises and as the drought conditions intensify, we can have a challenge with fresh water resources in the country. Uh, another thing that happens with um, climate change is that coral reefs are destroyed when the temperature of the water gets warmer. And when coral reefs shrink, the fish supply is reduced, so it begins to affect immediately your food source in the ocean. Okay? So climate change has implications for agriculture and agricultural production because of heavy rains, flooding, drought conditions. It has implications for fisheries uh, because of the warmer water and what it does to coral reefs. These things have implications for tourism um, and the attraction of tourists and the uh, design of tourism products and events. These have implications. These things, climate change has also implications for human health. And I want you to realize, therefore, that climate change is something that we should not treat lightly and we should have a concerted national plan and effort to be deal with these to deal with these issues now the cost of climate change mitigation is pretty high it is steep all right because when you're dealing with things like sea level rise coastal erosion human settlements issues threat to agriculture threat to fisheries these things the threat to tourism as an industry these things take a lot of money to deal with it and the world has responded to this by setting up a number of funds that are available for countries to access <clears throat> in order to deal with their, some of their climate change challenges. Now these funds are available but they are not easy to access. The demand for accountability has made the approach of many of these institutions very strong in terms of insisting on what you must put forward in order to get any money. And you really need uh, technical resources that are good to be able to do these things properly and ultimately get the money. So I want to close with that issue which is that we, climate change is real. It is affecting Trinidad and Tobago in a very real way. Uh, we must do something about it and have a concerted plan to do with it, deal with it. It costs a lot of money. That money is available and exists to deal with it, but that you must have the technical resources on the ground and the systems to meet the accountability stand, standards of the grants that uh, might be disbursed to this country. I also want to say that it is precisely because of the issues related to climate change and the difficulty it, that it poses for sustainable development that the UNC uh, in its last manifesto of 2015, which we did not get a chance to execute because we lost the election. And in this manifesto we are preparing, uh, have spent a, a lot of time and effort focusing on the blue economy, which is the sea that surrounds us. And many countries, not just the Caribbean, but the Pacific Islands and islands generally, are very sanguine to the fact that the oceans that surround them are sometimes larger than the landmass that you occupy and therefore the blue economy is a very important thing. That's why we have raised the issue of the green economy not only to move away from fossil fuels but have 
cleaner air, have more sustainable development, have more sustainable practices in business and industry, and basically to get climate friendly industries going. Okay? So the blue economy, the green economy. And the other economy that we have stressed about is, of course, the silver economy, which has to do with the aging nature of the population, but the aging nature of the population worldwide. And this also is has to do with the issue of sustainability, and they are also very climate-friendly things that you can do with that. And the other issue that we raise is the orange economy. The orange economy has to do with culture and the arts and all the industries that emanate from that. Most of those do not cause any problems for the environment and it is a very big global industry. So in trying to move Trinidad and Tobago from fossil fuel dependency in line with what we need to do to basically give the chance, give a chance to the planet to survive, we've seen all the things that are happening, the fires in California, the fires in Brazil, the devastation in other parts of the world, closer to home here in Barbados, the way the storm just sat on the Bahamas and destroyed the infrastructure and the significant portion of the economy of the Bahamas. We have seen what the destruction of climate change can do and mean and therefore we are taking steps not just to address the issue of climate change but to transform the economy into an economy that prepares us better for uh, first of all saving the planet, making our own country Trinidad and Tobago more sustainable and contributing to development that does not harm the environment or harm the planet and creates jobs for people. I will stop at this point and I'll be happy for any questions that you have. I will try my best to answer them and if I can't answer them, I will tell you honestly that I don't know the answer for them. Thank you very, very much for listening to me this morning. So good morning, Dr. Tiwari. One of the questions that we have this morning by our viewers is mangroves are being removed almost on a daily basis. What can be done to mitigate this issue in order to prevent coastal erosions? Yeah, I think that's an important question. I think we, I mean, we've got to protect the mangroves. Um, there's no question in my mind that there is a clash always between developmental objectives and um, uh, environmental conservation um, requirements and also ecological conservation uh, and recognition requirements. And you're always going to have that clash in development. I think as islands, we have to err on the side of uh, environmental conservation and ecological sensitivity. And I think that we should really take a strong stand on a number of issues that are affecting us now, one of which is the mangroves. But I think we should also take a, a strong stand, start, start on things like quarrying on the hills. I think we should and on quarrying generally. Not that we will stop it, but we will set rules, clear rules, by which they can be done. Uh, quarrying, I mean. But on the hills, we may want to take a much more severe view. Uh, hillside development, slash and burn agriculture, all of those things, I think we've got to look at them very, very seriously and take a conservationist approach and a sustainable development approach in the long term to these kinds of things. So I think by and large we should save our mangroves because the impact of these mangroves are not just that they sit there, but what they do for the ecology, and what they do for the, the environment, and what they do to prevent coastal erosion. Yeah? While another one of the questions that one of our viewers had is whilst trying to stimulate the blue economy, 
do you think it is possible to implement fish farming practices in that we grow what we eat, giving the natural fish stock time to replenish itself? Yes, and I think we should do that. You know, I one of the problems that we have here locally is that we've allowed our rivers to deteriorate and to be polluted. And um, I believe that we should take a long-term view and perhaps in collaboration, government with industry, as well as NGOs. We should take our decisions. As you know, we have a plan uh, when we get in government to basically deepen and broaden and dredge the river, all the rivers in Trinidad and Tobago, all these tributaries and so on, in order to deal with the flooding issues. And once and for all, and then have a maintenance system. But I think if we can do that, we can also clean up the rivers and create the conditions in which we can replenish the rivers with fish. And then create the opportunities, not just for fishing as a supply of food, but also for recreation purposes. Because people like to fish. I mean, I have a young grandson, he's 13 years old, and he loves to fish, and he enjoys it. And people in retirement and things love to fish. It's a nice recreation. It takes a lot of patience to be a good fisherman. Um, and those things are good. You know, it, it's a healthy kind of um, recreation. The second thing is that fish farming can be done in the ocean. I mean, they do it in places like Boston, Massachusetts, they do it in Florida. And we could learn from what they do there. Our climate is different, we may have to use different techniques, but we can certainly do that. And I really do think that, again, with fishing and with fish farming, we have to take a conservationist approach uh, if we do this so that we give the fish, the shrimps, whatever it is, time to replenish themselves. And there is a lot of inland fish farming that can be done. In my, um, in my own constituency, Kearney Central, we have one or two people who do fish farming very, very successfully here. Uh, one of those is Kent Farms, in which he started his fish farming on a 10-acre piece of land, and he's now moved to a larger piece of land in Orange Grove. And he is now getting his fish into the supermarkets. Um, so that, yes, there is a lot of opportunity in the blue economy um, and in using the ocean as well as the rivers and as well as ponds to develop a fishing industry. But if we do that, we would have to build up the uh, export side of the business in a very, very strategic way so that we want to feed ourselves and have that plentifully. We want to be able to cater to the tourists and that, that means we expand the tourism market so that more and more tourists come here to eat our fish. And we have very good fish here besides the tilapia that we know which you can grow on a farm. I mean kingfish is a super fish. It is a, a fish that can compete with the salmon of um, Canada. You know, it's a very tasty fish. And we have red snapper in the Caribbean that really is an ex exceptional fish. And we also have the local salmon and other fish here. I just mentioned three. But these things we can do in a significant way. And then we can learn from what other people are doing. For instance, there's a lot of fish farming in Brazil. We can learn from that. I think this is now developing as a strategy in Guyana. We can learn from that. You know, so we need not reinvent the, the wheel. The main thing is to have an industry plan that allows us to take advantage of a growing tourism market, a taste-changing local market, and also an ex export market. Dr. Tiwari, direct and indirect sources of pollution hampers the proliferation of oceanic life, especially with industries. How can we engage these stakeholders to promote more sustainable waste disposal practices? 
I think we have a serious problem in Trinidad now. I think that the industrial achievements that we have had in Point Lisas have also led to heavy pollution of the Gulf of Paria. And I think it is affecting the food life, the life of the things that we get for food, whether fish or shrimp or others over there. I think we need to sit down with the industry. I think businesses are becoming very enlightened now. I think people need understand that we need to go greener, uh, that we need to have more sustainable businesses, that you have to take stakeholders into account, that you have to take the community into account, that you have to take neck the other generations into account. And I think there is need for an enlightened discussion that would basically create the conditions for less or no pollution of the seas surrounding Point Lisas. I think the oil industry is a problem. We can also address that. Many of these international companies have various enlightened practices that they do to protect the environment. But drilling obviously has effects and we can basically work with the companies to be able to do that. I think you have to take a collaborative approach to these things because we need investment, we need jobs, we need growth, we need uh, to have uh, income and opportunity and we need to encourage entrepreneurship and investment. But at the same time, you can't destroy the country that you are living in and you enjoy it for a while, one generation, two generations, and then the place is unlivable after that. So I think we have to make calculated choices about these and be very clear about it. I think if you had a serious government in this country and it made it clear what it stood for, I think everybody would fall in line and cooperate. Dr. Tiwari, rising sea levels can pose a great problem for the drainage of watersheds. Granted that we already challenged we are challenged with these issues of flooding. Is there a national flooding mitigation plan in the pipeline of the relief and reduce the nervousness people feel when rain falls? We had a national flooding mitigation plan in 2013, uh, which I helped to negotiate with the IDB, and in which the client ministry was the Ministry of the Environment. But when this government came into office, it, um, it jettisoned that plan and did not proceed with it. This was supposed to focus on the city of Port of Spain. I think you know every time rain drizzles a little bit, you have a flood in Port of Spain. And this was supposed to take care of that. And because I had responsibility for Shagaramas, I also understood that there was a, a challenge because of the one sea level rise and also the flowing of the rivers into the ocean, that there were issues having to do with pollution from the rivers into the ocean um, in Shagaramas but also elsewhere along the north. West, sorry, the, yeah, the western coast um, and the northwestern coast of the um, of the island of Trinidad. So, yes, I, I, I don't want to deal with it here because I, I have dealt with it elsewhere and I could deal with it again. But there has to be a program, first of all, for water capture and then distribution and deployment in the dry season to support a number of things, not just drinking water, but irrigation for farmers and so on. Uh, that has to do with flood mitigation, including retention ponds, dredging of the rivers, and whatever else we needed to do. And this has to be a comprehensive plan for Trinidad and Tobago to minimize the possibilities. I don't think you can ever say there will never be any flooding, but you can create the conditions in which, first of all, uh, most times when rainfall, flood will not take place. And secondly, even with excessive rains, you can manage. And thirdly, 
should the rains be so excessive and unpredictable that you did have floods, that you have some kind of mitigation plan and preparation for a disaster situation in your country. And I think that is how we have to think now because the world is becoming so unpredictable and the swings of climate change are also un so unpredictable. Dr. Tiwari, as you mentioned, global warming and rising sea levels threaten the existence of our already struggling coral reef. Do you think it is possible to engineer the buccal reef to its former glory? Engineer what? The buccal reef? Yeah. Yes, I think so. I mean, other places have shown us what can be done when reefs are damaged and uh, I mean what you have to do is to learn from others you don't have to reinvent the wheel I mean that is what no the knowledge age means that is what global research means that is what knowledge transfer means but you have to have the will and you have to have the support systems not just funds but the support systems and with these kinds of things given the concern for the environment, for coral reefs and so on, all over the world. You will get volunteers, you'll get collaborating uh, universities, you will get research people willing to help you. So these are not problems that cannot be solved. These are problems that you have to address and say, well, what do we need to solve them? What are the resources we need to bring and how do we get them together? and they can, be, they can be done. What, what impact or how does an indiscriminate slash and burn of destruction of our hillsides and other greenery in exchange for housing product, projects sorry, affect our islands? No, I think we have to stop slash and burn. We just cannot allow it anymore. And we have to plant more trees immediately. I mean, every year should, we should literally be planting thousands of trees. And there are ways to do that. You know, you can get the school children involved at every level of the school. Um, you can designate regions in which you want to plant trees. On Corpus Christi Day, we can have a general planting in which households are involved and community organizations are involved and you have a national effort in certain parts of the country. And we have to cut the slash and burn. But when you realize that the slash and burn is done because of economic need, you also have to address that too. And I think if you educate people and you talk to them reasonably and you give them an alternative source of income or economic opportunity, we can solve those problems. We really have to take a whole different approach to governance in the world. Now, we are seeing it every day with what is happening in the world. Um, and we certainly have to take a different approach to governance in Trinidad and Tobago. The kind of authoritarian approach of the government of Trinidad and Tobago, the current government, Prime Minister Rowley and his ministers and the way they deal with people and talk to people and talk down to people and are so contemptuous in the remarks that they make about people. I think we have to stop all of that, man. People are fed up of it. You know, it is really debilitating in its effect uh, on human energy for good. And um, I really think that we have to get rid of that kind of culture from our society and we have to really create a, a stakeholder approach to the whole business of governance and management that is consultative in nature and is based on mutual respect. Dr. Tiwari, water sports are an important tourism activity and a lucrative ecosystem service. Do you think, granted, that we have some of the best beaches in the world and we promote tourism, we should capitalize on the development of water sports similar to that of Stenusha? Yes, we, we can. And again, we must do that taking into account the, the environment, okay? Because you can do the water sports and if you do it indiscriminately, you can cause other problems. So the thing is to manage it holistically from the beginning. And because 
these things are relatively new in Trinidad. I mean, you have a few people who take advantage of the ocean for sports, but it is not a big, this is not a big tourist place for water sports, but we can have it. Um, there are a number of things that we can do with the ocean. I mean, the sheltered nature of Trinidad and Tobago um, and the relative security of it from the weather patterns and storms and hurricanes and so on really make us an ideal place for um, yachting in Trinidad and Tobago, okay? But of course with yachting comes other problems. People dump their waste, um, so you, you have to deal with the waste disposal issue. The second thing is that sometimes there is criminal behavior including drugs and criminal elements using yachts, etc. And you need to take that into account so that the security issues are also critical. But a good yachting industry could build a, a whole set of spin-off industries here, but the question is that we have never really been able to sustain the yachting industry over a longer period of time in Trinidad and Tobago. The other thing are the water sports. I mean, look at the beautiful areas we have around Chagaramas. Um, we started, when I was minister, the CDA started, um, what you call it, uh, the Chinese dragon boat racing uh, and so on. And uh, um, there are other things that we can do. I mean, Chagaramas could be used as a water sporting area. You can do things. I know that we have um, sporting events in Maracas in which people do a number of athletic um, things together, including swimming. And we could do that. We could really, really use the water more for sports, link it to tourism, etc. And it's good, it's healthy, it's exciting, it creates a spectatorship. All right, you know, so I think that there's a lot of potential there. But we have to be aware that when we do these things, we have to take a holistic approach and not damage the environment in the process. So there always must be maintenance and rehabilitation measures together with these things. More than managing the ocean, how do you think we can manage terrestrial practices like irresponsible disposal of garbage and water sources, for example, to reduce our impact on the oceanic habitat? Yeah, the, the garbage is a problem both on the sea and on land. I mean, sometimes I said to one of my staff the other day that, you know, we are lit literally drowning in garbage and filth in this country. So. I, I didn't plan to deal with that today, but one of the things that we have to do is to find a comprehensive solution for garbage disposal in this country. It is not effective at the present time to have it on landfills and with all the consequences of that. And we have problems with Beetham, we have problems with the other one in South Central Trinidad, South Central Trinidad. And, um, I think we need to find a better, better and more comprehensive me methodology for the disposal of garbage on the land. And we also need to introduce a system which allows garbage to be separated at the home and uh, which really allows us to differentiate between the types of garbage to be able to dispose of them and recycle and so on differently. And on the ocean, I mean, we cannot afford in a tropical island such as Trinidad and Tobago to have nasty seas and to have garbage on the seas. Uh, it has not become a big problem yet, but it's a problem in the rivers and the rivers then go into the sea and it causes a problem and we have to attend to that too. So I think if we are serious about a blue economy and if we are serious about greening the economy, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have to deal with the issue of a comprehensive garbage solution, both on land and in sea, and we have to have strict laws uh, for those who would use um, the freedom that is allowed in a democracy 
to pollute the place. A lot of people drop, drop their garbage all over the place indiscriminately and you can't, we just cannot allow that anymore. Dr. Tiwari, do you think it would be possible to get each community together to generate their own clean energy? And if so, how should it be promoted? That's uh, The simple answer is yes, it is possible to do that. It has to start with education. Secondly, it must involve consultation and engagement. Thirdly, it must involve, make, cause uh, involvement of the population uh, in each community. And fourthly, there must be something in it for the communities. They must get some benefit. Okay? Now, the problem with Trinidad and Tobago is that energy is so cheap because of natural gas. We create energy by the feeding of natural gas and uh, the conversion of that into electricity. Um, and therefore, there is not the incentive to find alternative forms of energy. But the truth is that if we produce more of our energy by clean methods, we could then export more of our oil and natural gas, etc., until it becomes depleted and we would get foreign exchange for those things. So yes, I think the way to deal with that is not to go for a comprehensive national strategy, but to go for pilots in communities that have an interest. And then we work with them to see how, what makes it successful and then how to improve and we then learn each time and take it into all those communities that are interested. But I think people could um, focus on, first of all, they can focus on organic agriculture, they could focus on home gardening, they could focus on turning garbage into energy. Um, in other words, you start with a household, uh, you can get the schools involved in, in particular communities. That means you get the parents, the teachers, the children involved in these things. Um, uh, you can basically develop you know, food security um, practices in particular communities. You can do rainwater harvesting. Um, you, you can do solar if people are so minded, you know, that might have a community reach rather than a national extended reach. Depending on where the community is located, you can have experimentation with wind farms, things like that. It is possible to do that. And sometimes experimentation and pilot projects is a good way to go because you can immediately see the results, the success make the necessary corrections and improvements as well. Dr. Tiwari, rising sea levels will mean a more saline water will accrete to inland making the water on the lower courses of our rivers and streams brackish. What do you think are the implications of this and how can we manage this? I mentioned that in my opening. I said that as you have sea level rise and you have very hot weather that uh, kind of drought conditions, you're going to have a reduction in the amount of fresh water that is available. Uh, one, because um, the hot water will, uh, I mean the hot season um, will make, will dry up the water sources, okay? And secondly, the seawater will enter the um, freshwater sources and pollute them so that you end up with seawater in the freshwater and therefore they are not usable in that condition. So both issues have to be addressed. We have to be aware that that is an issue and we have to prepare ourselves to be able to deal with that. But as I said, I have a comprehensive plan. The UNC has a comprehensive plan for water capture, water retention, cleaning, dredging of the rivers, opening up the water courses, etc. And I think that if we proceeded on that, we'll be able to better manage this. Sea level rise requires attention on its own. In taking a sustainable approach to preserving our oceans and life in the ocean, do you think it is feasible to implement legislation 
to discourage the population from using one-use plastic items such as plastic bags and plastic straws? Yes, I, I, I think we have to figure out how we are going to do that. I think some, there is some consciousness here that look, let's not use plastic bags anymore. I think people are aware that the plastic containers are a problem um, and that we need to find some way of doing this. The nature of innovation in the world, I think will find some solutions to these things. But you know, Dominica just this week took a decision that will allow them to ban all plastics from coming into the country. And it is a small island, it's true, it has a small population. But if you've ever been to Dominica, I mean, when you talk about a beautiful, lush, green, hilly, abundant country, it is that island. It is not a very wealthy island, but you also do not have horrible poverty on that island either. And they have been devastated by the hurricane some years ago and they are now catching themselves. So that, you know, if they can do that on a small scale in Dominica, I think we can systematically do things like that in Trinidad and Tobago as well. Dr. Tiwari, one of our viewers would like to hear your opinion on what they have to say. I honestly think that the beach cleanups and environmental cleanups should become a mandatory part of school and workplace plans at least once for the year. This way, citizens may become more mindful when littering. Yes, I, I think you have a point. Uh, but let's look at it from two sides. One is the beach cleanup, which means that you have to clean up the mess that other people make. And the other one are the people who mess up the beach. So I think you have to deal with both. And when you deal with children and the schools, you raise consciousness, that's true. So when you clean up the beaches and the children are involved, it raises consciousness, it raises awareness, it, be, it gets them involved, the issues are internalized and they become better citizens. They are less likely to be polluters when they become adults, you know? So that is a very good thing. But we also have to take a very strong stand on the people who pollute. You know, people go on the beaches, they dump all kinds of things. I mean, I don't understand that kind of behavior. People take their garbage from one part of the community, they dump it in another community. I don't understand that kind of behavior. They go into a lonely place that is absolutely pristine, forest, trees, all kinds of things. They drop a set of garbage and I mean we cannot allow that to happen man. people have to have some self-discipline and there has to be some laws to help them with the self-discipline okay well I want to thank you for spending this time with me this morning and for asking such very very penetrating and highly conscious questions that you asked because you are concerned about the environment and you are concerned also about development, especially sustainable development. It's been a pleasure being with you this morning and I will see you again next Tuesday. Remember our time for this program is every Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Thank you very much for being with us today. My name is Boindra Dat Tiwari. I'm the Member of Parliament for Karani Central and I represent the United National Congress in the opposition of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much for listening to me. I want to thank all of those on the radio station, 97.5, for listening this morning as well. And the radio station, um, 97.5, for carrying this particular program live. Uh, it's wonderful to have the benefit of your hearing me on radio and I thank you very, very much for listening to me.